Introduction. Sermon, I just didn't have a really um, meaningful name that I could uh, put on this sermon, so I just call it God's First Fruits. It is a tradition going back to the days of HWA, Herbert W. Armstrong, that uh, the morning sermon on a holy day it doesn't, it doesn't exclude the afternoon sermon on the holy day as well, but the morning sermon, at least wanted one sermon during the, uh, during the holy day to be in part an explanation about the meaning of the holy day. But no, I would, I would hasten to add to that, no holy day can be fully explained in a single sermon. It, would, it takes many sermons to explain any one of the holy days, and then we wouldn't get it all. There's a lot there to explain. So multiple sermons are required to explain every holy day. My personal opinion, and one which I have been working with over some years now, there's a relationship between the Beatitudes and the Holy Convocations, you know, we talk about in Leviticus 23, there are listed Holy Convocations, and then it says whether or not you can work on that day. And uh, the Holy Convocation that we think about in that regard where, where we come together, but it's not a holy day, is Passover, because Christ himself did that. <clears throat> There's a relationship between the Beatitudes and the Holy Convocation. That's my personal opinion. There is a relationship between the Beatitudes and the Holy Convocations given to us in Leviticus 23. This is not church doctrine. Hasten to add that. But it seems to me that this opinion is entirely supportive of church doctrine. I don't think it, it uh, violates church doctrine to look at this, uh, look at these Beatitudes. And I've heard uh, people speak on the Beatitudes who didn't seem to have anything except to read them and not to explain what they meant. So we want to consider in this sermon whether or not the fourth beatitude relates to the third holy day. The third holy day is Pentecost, but Pentecost is uh, the fourth holy convocation. Because you add back in before the first holy day, you add back in uh, Passover. I talked about in the sermonette the names of the three holy days. One we most normally speak of is Pentecost, or the count of 50. And uh, that relates as well to some other things like uh, the 50th, day, and the Jubilee year. There is a Jubilee year, which uh, if you're normal, you aren't going to celebrate two Jubilee years in your lifetime, because that's 50, they're 50 years before the next one. If you uh, observe one, then you then you, you got to wait 50 years before you could observe another. Uh, but Pentecost is the 50th day from the Sabbath during the days of unleavened bread. Let's read Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. Example of this particular convocation and holy day. It's a convocation and a holy day uh, is given to us in Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. The, the appropriate use of the day of Pentecost 
as we see exemplified here in Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. You see, the Bible here speaks of this occasion as being Pentecost or the 50th was fully come. They were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a great sound from heaven as the rushing of a mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. So that's an example of how Pentecost is used to explain this occasion or identify this occasion. Deuteronomy 16 and verse 10, and we already were at previously at Deuteronomy 16 and verse 16, and uh, whether or not empty meant empty hand or empty inside you, a good uh, additional explanation. You shall keep, Deuteronomy 16 and verse 10, you shall keep the feast of weeks. Now that's the same day that we read about in Acts chapter 2 and verse 1 as Pentecost. And uh, Pentecost might be used in some other places throughout the Bible. And the Feast of Weeks is also used for the same occasion during the days of, uh, during the, uh, the, the festival of, of Pentecost. You shall keep the Feast of Weeks unto the Lord your God with a tribute of a free will offering of your hand, which you shall give unto the Lord your God, according to the according as the Lord has blessed you. We also see it's identified as the feast of first fruits. Leviticus twenty three and verse four and verse ten. I put down here those two scriptures. These are it says at the start of the annual holy days or the annual convocations. These are the feasts of the Lord. And it's going to give you a litany that follows throughout Leviticus 23. These are where all of God's holy occasions are identified in one chapter. Not that there aren't some other places that uh, some other observances might be uh, identified as well. These, but it says there in Leviticus 23... These are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations. It doesn't say holy days. It says holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their season. Dropping down to verse 10, speak to the children of Israel and say unto them, when you, give unto, when you come into the land, now they hadn't crossed the Jordan River. They were still on the coming in side of the Jordan River. They were going to cross the Jordan River and um, come into the land, The prom what was uh, the promised land. When you come into the land which I gave unto you and shall reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits. Feast of first fruits is being uh, pictured it, not at that time that they, that they take it to the priest, but 50 days thereafter, as it goes on to tell us. Then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. The third holy day and the fourth holy convocation can be referred to by any of the three names. That's just informational to you. But let's look at what I said what I wanted to do is to in this sermon was to identify whether or not the fourth beatitude related to the day of Pentecost. <clears throat> and what is the fourth beatitude say? Can you quote the fourth beatitude? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And on the day of Pentecost, we th think of it as a celebration. 
But how does Pentecost relate to hunger and thirst for righteousness? How does that how is that connection made? If if I believe that it is, if it's my opinion that Pentecost, Feast of First Fruits, Feast of Weeks, whichever name you want to call it by, that that name is picturing hungering and thirsting after righteousness. That seems a little far-fetched, maybe, if you don't look at it and you don't know some of the history behind that. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 20 and verse 1. <clears throat> and here we're going to see that God's commandments were given to Moses on the day of Pentecost. It was the day they left Egypt. They crossed the desert from Egypt to the Red Sea. And you can follow pretty much the account in the book of Exodus and how far they went, where they were. And uh, it was seven days or six days before they got to the Red Sea. And then Pharaoh is hightailing it after them going to bring them back and put them back into slavery, I guess. Or maybe he was just going to decimate them and destroy them. And they got to the Red Sea and God protected them at the Red Sea from the Egyptian army. And so they, they crossed the Red Sea and that was on the seventh, the seventh day from the Passover, wasn't it? Seven days to do that. And after they crossed the Red Sea and uh, took some additional days. On the 50th day, they were at Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai, God gave to Moses the Ten Commandments, I believe written on tablets of stone. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 1. God spoke all these words saying, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. This is the last one of the commandments in verse 17. The Ten Commandments are given there on the day of Pentecost to the nation of Israel through Moses. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, his manservant, his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is your neighbor's. All the people saw the thunderings, lightnings, and it was a great display of power there at Mount Sinai at the time when God gave these commandments to the Israelites and at the time when the Israelites made a covenant with God. It's called in the Bible in various places the Old Covenant. This was the first covenant between God and Israel. And that first covenant was based on these days or these commandments that we know of as the Ten Commandments. And so Moses was given those. And uh, in verse 17, all the people saw the thunderings. It was a great display of power hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Here's a identification of righteousness, isn't it? They got the commandments of God. And we'll look at the definition of righteousness here in a minute. They said unto Moses, speak with us, and we shut God down. We, don't want, we, we can't stand this. We're going to be all killed if God continues this. And so Moses acted accordingly. They said unto Moses, Speak you with us and we will hear, but do not let God speak with us any more lest we die. They were, they were receiving righteousness. Now here's what it says. I'll read it here in case I got it wrong when I was quoting it without looking. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6. There are, by the way, eight Different Beatitudes. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, 
for they shall be filled. It fits in the order of things. You know, if you have the first holy convocation, second holy convocation, third holy convocation, this is the fourth holy convocation, which would relate to, seemingly, the day of Pentecost. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. They shall be filled. Hungering and thirsting after righteousness, that implies, infers an appetite for righteousness. Now, maybe they didn't exactly continue in that attitude of righteousness, but the day of Pentecost, I would say, pictures righteousness because, number one, righteousness relates to the commandments of God. And on the day of Pentecost, the commandments of God were given to the ancient Israelites. <clears throat> Hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Maybe they weren't, but maybe we should be fulfilling that. The hungering and thirsting after righteousness. After the keeping of God's commandments. Because here's what it says about righteousness. Psalms 119, 172. Psalms chapter 119, verse 172. My tongue shall speak of your word for all your commandments are righteousness. All of God's commandments are righteousness. And I thought many years ago that you can't have some of God's commandments and be righteous. If you, if you don't have them all, then you don't have righteousness. If you have eight of the commandments, if you keep eight of the commandments, but you don't keep the other two, you can't be identified as being righteous. It takes all of them to be identified as being righteous. So, would that qualify with the commandments being given to the Israelites on the day of Pentecost at Mount Sinai as de defining this day of Pentecost and relating it to righteousness, the obedience to God's commandments. All your commandments define the definition of righteousness. Jumping forward by more than a couple of centuries, Peter preached repentance to the multitude on the day of Pentecost. Repentance re related in what way? Well, repentance was repentance uh, for having broken the commandments of God. And so on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached that to the multitude outside of the building there in Jerusalem. <clears throat> and breaking, um, going forward from there to Hebrews chapter 8, verses 8 through 11, There, uh, apparently Paul wrote this. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 8, finding fault with them. He's talking about those people who were the party to the old covenant, the ancient Israelites. Finding fault with them, he said, behold the days come says the Lord, I will make a new covenant. If there is a new covenant, there must have been a prior covenant which we identify as the old covenant. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the days that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land 
of Egypt because they did not continue in that first covenant. And I regarded them not, says the Lord. <clears throat> For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. Now righteousness, I will put my laws into their mind. Is there a connection between righteousness and what Peter said on the day of Pentecost and when it was that God began to... Uh, employ this new covenant. I will put my laws. All your commandments are righteousness. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord for all shall know me from the least, least to the greatest. On the day of Pentecost, God made a new covenant which with men and wrote the law on their hearts. Written on tablets of stone in the old covenant. But then God wrote the law, his commandments, on the hearts of men. And as a result of having that those commandments written on your heart, you should hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 4, that seems to be a precursor to being with Christ when he returns and living and reigning with him on the earth for a thousand years. Revelation chapter 14 verse 4. It says there, and these are people who are identified as being with Christ at his return. These are they, it says in Revelation chapter 4, I mean 14 verse 4. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Now, I don't think having a relationship with a wife is going to defile anybody, but I think this is uh, prophetic language. Pro prophetic language. If you have a relationship with a false church, prophecy and prophecy, a woman is spoken of as a church. A church is spoken of as a woman. Here this says... They were not defiled with women. False churches, I would, I would say that's the way that should be understood. These are they which follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits to God and to the Lamb. It says in... Revelation chapter 17 and verse 14. These it shall make war with the Lamb. The Lamb shall overcome them. This is at his return. He shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords. That is, could have been translated as I understand it. The priest of the priestly ones. Lord of lords. Priests of the priestly ones. These uh, shall make war with the Lamb. The Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords, priest of the priestly ones, and king of kings, kings and priests. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Called, chosen, and faithful. Tells us in Matthew 24, I believe it is, those who endure to the end 
will be saved. That's, that's a requirement for being righteous, obedient to God's commandments. And if we can do that until the end, it says, you shall be saved. What is the destiny of the first fruits? By the way, Christ is the first of the first fruits, it tells us. Let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 16 through 20. And Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, which uh, was not particularly noted for being uh, a church that that uh, really appreciated righteousness at all. First Corinthians chapter fifteen, verse sixteen: If the dead do not rise, or if throw that out because. We know from the scriptures that the dead will rise. But it said if the dead don't rise, then Christ couldn't have been raised either. And if uh, Christ couldn't have been raised, then everybody who has died have perished. See, the the resurrection of Christ is required in order for any of us to have salvation. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 18. They which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished if Christ doesn't rise. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19. If in this life only, if that's the full extent of everything we have to look forward to, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Probably should have been translated the first of the first fruits of those who had died. Christ is the first of the first fruits. But we also as you said here, our first fruits, you know, in the garden through um, 2,000 years from the time of the new covenant until the present, there, it, if we took, uh, take the instruction uh, from the previous uh, part of the sermon, if we take that instruction to be our, our instruction, that um, the, all of the first fruits of the ground were to be brought to God, would be picturing all of us for 2,000 years as being first fruits of God. And we, would, we also then it would be Christ is the first of the first fruits, and we are also first fruits. James chapter 1 and verse 17. Every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variableness. He can count on what he has said. Neither shadow of turning. Of his own will, he begot us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of His creatures. We should be. A kind of first fruits of His creatures. First fruits are also holy. Romans 11, chapter 16. If the first fruits, it says, be holy, <clears throat> the first fruit, not plural, 
If the first fruit, in other words, the first of the first fruits, Jesus Christ, is holy, and we all know that we know that he was and is, the lump is also holy. The following first fruits are also holy, not just Christ, but you, not because you're able to perfectly keep God's commandments, hungering and hungering and thirsting after righteousness, but because Christ gives you forgiveness for the sins that you have committed. Blessed and holy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. If the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy, and the root is holy, and so are the branches. I don't know if we're a leaf, a twig, a branch, a root, or what we would be classified at as, as, in that, as that analogy is used. But the first fruits, it said, if the first of the first fruits, if Christ be holy, then the rest of us also are holy, not of our own doing, but because Christ has died for us and extended forgiveness to us so that we also can be holy. Romans 8, verse 21. It's a little bit of the language here that is not translated as <clears throat> completely well as it could be. Romans 8, verse 21. And we'll read through verse 23. Because the creature, it says in the KJV, the original word is the creation. It's not talking about the creature being delivered from the bondage of corruption, but it's talking about the entire creation. It's giving the, the entire creation emotional feelings and and personification you know disney personified things that were that were not actually uh, living things at all but he made them into on the screen at least things which were alive and had all of the characteristics and emotional feelings of human beings the creation itself shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into what? Delivered from what? From the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of you. The entire creation is going to be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. That's the reason you've been called. That's the reason we baptized Janice yesterday and most of the rest of us have been baptized and others are on the road there into the glorious liberty of the children of God. The entire creation is going to be under the control of of those people who are going to be born at the return of Christ, the first fruits of God, who hunger and thirst after righteousness and endure to the end. They will be in charge of the entire creation. They're going to be, the cre creation is going to be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. We know the whole creation groans. I've never been involved in this kind of groaning, and uh, yet a number of you have. This is talking about childbirth. It's like the whole creation is going to be involved 
in this kind of activity. We know the whole creation groans and travails and pain together until now. That's, that's really strictly childbirth language, isn't it? When we had uh, Daniel for the blessing of little children and we talked about childbirth in that sermon, this is childbirth language. The entire creation groaning as a woman having a child and travailing in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the birth. It says the adoption here, but probably a better translation would be we wait for our birth at the return of Jesus Christ. Talks about that in, in 1 Thessalonians 4. That um, Christ will return, the trumpet will sound, and uh, all, of the, all of the people who are alive and remain at that time will not precede those who have died and been buried. The dead in Christ will rise first and after the dead in Christ rise then come those who are alive and remain and they will meet Christ in the air. The first fruits. Waiting for adoption so to wit to wit the redemption of our body. Matthew 5 and verse 6. Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled. All of God's commandments are righteousness. Commandments were, it's not the initial <clears throat> time, but it's after they had been lost, they were recovered at Mount Sinai. Commandments were given. Those commandments were given on the day of Pentecost, on at the Feast of First Fruits, or at the Feast of Weeks, whichever name you want to apply to them. Command, those commandments were given on the day of Pentecost. On the very day, Pentecost, God began to write his law on the hearts of those who made a covenant with him. It happened on the day of Pentecost. The law of God began to be written on the hearts of men and that covenant has been by extension ultimately offered to every human being who ever lived. And there are a number of people who are being prepared to help bring that to pass for the greater part of humanity. So what do you think? Does the day of Pentecost relate to the fourth holy convocation? To me, this beatitude, when related to the day of Pentecost, strongly supports church doctrine. 